So thank you for joining us today um, on uh, the second day of Celebrate Learning Week. And it, it's great to see so many people uh, joining us on particularly a non-rainy day as well. My name is Will Ingle. I'm a strategist for Open Education Initiatives with the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology. And I'm joined by a couple of my colleagues. I'm very excited to be working with both AJ Afsani, and I'm going to um, turn it over to them to introduce themselves. So AJ, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is AJ. I'm one of the advisors at the Center for Accessibility, and I've been there for six-ish years. Hi, my name is Afsane Sharif. Uh, I'm faculty liaison senior project manager with Center for Teaching and Learning Technology. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that UBC Vancouver, which is hosting this session, is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And as we're meeting virtually uh, today, I'd like to acknowledge that here in the Lower Mainland, uh, we're often on the unceded territories of the Squamish, tsleil and other Coast Salish people. Uh, you may be joining us from many different areas, and I'd like to take a moment to appreciate, consider, and give respect to the lands in which we are situated. And speaking to our lands, uh, the BC Campus Open Textbook pulling together a guide for indigenous, <clears throat> excuse me, indigenization of post-secondary institutions um, describes an indigenous epistemology, one of the indigenous epistemologies as relationality. Um, and this is the concept that we're all related to each other and our relationships create interdependencies. Um, the BC Campus Guide suggests that instructors and curriculum uh, developers can apply the concept of relationality by creating learning opportunities that really emphasize learning and relationships and community. Um, and I'd like to think that's a strong theme that you'll hear echoed in our discussions today um, about teaching with care and accessibility. Um, so I will just throw a link out to that guide momentarily. Um, before we begin, I'd also like to note the session is being recorded and closed captioning is turned on. You can toggle closed captions on or off on your end of the Zoom window. Uh, there should be a button uh, that's labeled CC for closed captions in the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, we have posted our slides and our resources, including different links um, to this wiki page here. So if you wanna use uh, a copy of the slides to follow along, please do so. And you'll see uh, that the first link on that page is a guide to the BC campus pulling together a guide for indigenizations of post-secondary uh, institutions that I've I uh, just mentioned. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Afsani to talk about what we're going to talk about. Thanks, Will. Hi, everyone. I want to acknowledge that I'm zooming in from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of Muscan people. Hope you and your loved ones are staying safe and well during this pandemic and global crisis. On March 2020, we all needed flexibility, accessibility, and accommodation as we all had to move to online environment. We were experiencing a crisis of access that resembled to the crisis of access of the people with disabilities that they have exper experienced for many years in our educational system. Systematic barriers in learning and using new technology. On the plus side, during the COVID, the, this pandemic has resulted a valuable advancement in accessibility and inclusion. And it's important for us to hold on to these gains. That's why today's session is on the teaching with care, focusing on accessibility and inclusion. With that, the agenda for today is reflection on accessibility at UBC, consideration for designing inclusive and accessible online materials, introduction to open in ed teaching and, and learning, and why open education is important, and rationale for how open educational resources support accessibility. Now let's look at what is accessibility and why it matters. First, um, I would like to invite you all to use your uh, mic or chat, share one word to describe what this term means to you, accessibility. Draw from your own life, your classroom teaching, your research activity, or other parts of your life. What does accessibility mean to you? Please use chat or Mike to um, to say what the openness, yeah, universal, inclusive, fair, equity, all, participation for all. Those are all all great poems. Thank you all for brainstorming on that. 
So here, what we look at what accessibility means and how we define it here. Accessibility in a simple language in education means giving all a student equal opportunity to learn. It's ability to um, access. And um, in education means that all students are e given equal opportunity to learn. Designing for your instruction and educational material for accessibility is a actually an important part of ensuring that these opportunity are given to those people and giving them access to the same opportunity is important. Uh, we always encourage um, um, everyone um, to think about designing for accessibility means a good design. It's, a, it's not only for disabled, it's for non-disabled, like for regular people. Um, and we will talk about um, some of those um, a strategy that you can make your um, course and program more inclusive in the next few slides. One thing that I like to mention is that in order for us to move forward and make things more accessible, there are three and more factors involved. One is um, assistive technology that um, people with disability might use. Um, the other factor is instructor, um, educational developer, or um, learning designer who are involved in the course and um, program design that they need to follow those guidelines um, if it's online following W3 standards. And the third person, uh, the third factor is the disabled individual, um, the responsibility that they have in order to inform um, the community about their needs and look for the resources that are existing. So the next slide, I wanna talk about why does it matter? Um, we talk about what is accessibility. Now we wanna know why even it uh, doesn't matter that we pay attention to accessibility and you hear more. According to a stat, Canada in 2017, one in five uh, Canadian over 15 has a disability. I was attending a session at um, Ability Summit, Summit in Microsoft. They are saying that 50% um, of Americans have one kind of disability. And if you look at what we have in Canada, one in five, this is kind of um, in all sectors of our community and it's showing up in, in um, our community and UBC community, you can see that we have this number of um, students also and um, participants or community members who are um, have one kind of a disability. Now let's look at um, accessibility at UBC. With UBC AMS 2020 Academic Experience Survey Report, it showed that one quarter of our undergrad report having one, one or more disability, which is um, uh, kind of more than 2019, which was 22%. Mental illness is as the most important and common disability among our, our, our students. And one third of those who identify themselves with disability have registered with Center for Accessibility. So um, if you at, have attended um, this morning keynote, one of the reason that people may not be registered with Center for Accessibility might be cultural things. It might be frustration, it might be um, stigma, or it might be something related to their own um, and dealing with their disabilities. So one third of those who are struggling with the system or have some needs of accommodation uh, register with Center for Accessibility. Another data or survey that we've done is the um, undergrad experience survey 2021. Um, there are some of the things that I'd like to share with you is that with UBC Vancouver, we have 4,183 students currently registered with um, Center for Accessibility, which means that in your students, among UBC students, over 4,000 students need some kind of accommodation. We have 17% that they have mental health condition and 14% of those have other medical condition. We have 64% of our students at UBC Vancouver experiencing financial stress. And uh, we share some of the information about responsibility that 6% of our learners have some kind of a care responsibility. These are all hurdles that um, are um, students have and they are facing. 
With UVCO, we have 910 students registered with the Disability Resource Center, 23% mental health condition, 19 have other um, conditions, and 84% have um, and are experiencing financial stress. And the reason I share this data is just to know and get to know your students more and their needs and uh, this, to see that uh, what kind of a background they have and what kind of uh, um, personalities or characteristics they bring to the classroom and some of the challenges that they are facing. Um, um, I was shocked by seeing the financial stress on our students and the number of mental health issues, the percentage that is going up a few percent um, every year. So um, I just we just wanted to um, show that these are the importance of um, accessibility. One thing that I'd like to share with you here is um, UBC, um, how UBC is responding and providing support. And um, one of the policy that UBC has is LR7 policy, which is about disability accommodation. Um, it talks about responsibility um, as UBC as an organization that they have to students to provide a welcoming environment for students, uh, not denying admission based on their disability and making sure programs are accessible for students. Um, also ensuring that um, staff and faculty are provided with relevant information about the policies and procedures. And there are more information on that um, about this policy. Um, there are also some information about uh, the individual, what kind of a responsibility they have and what they need to do. Um, there is a one uh, frequently asked question about policy LR7 for those instructors who, who are not familiar what to do and where to start if they uh, uh, their student come and say, I need an accommodation, um, the, how to deal with their privacy, how to respond to their needs. There are these uh, frequently asked question um, on the policy LR7 is very, very useful um, resource. Now, I'd like to um, discuss about accessibility from a designer perspective and how to make our uh, courses and programs more inclusive. Let's look at the system that we use for online environment, um, Canvas. So um, I, from the designer perspective, some of the very simple things that you can do or as an instructor to look at it is that Canvas has a built-in accessibility checker within its rich content editor um, that you can use. Um, there is a link to that. There is also Blackboard Ally that which help you to understand how accessible your course is. It gives, it can provide you alternative format um, for your course, whether it's audio or EPUB or Braille. Um, and one thing about Blackboard Ally is that it also can give us um, an overall institutional level information of how many of our courses are accessible. If you want to try Blackboard Ally, you can contact lthub at uvc.ca. Talking about inclusive and universal design for learning, there are so many resources and I won't be able to get to all the details, but I wanna just share with you that um, we are going to talk about universal design and promote it because it's, it's a framework that cover a design and providing options for students and accessible design can um, be part of it. Um, and I will talk about those in, in more details in the next few slides. Um, inclusive teaching resource is also um, a website that gives uh, some resources, training workshops, upcoming workshops about um, those who are interested about making their um, program more inclusive. Um, so I would recommend you all to have a look at that resource as well. So let's look at what does um, accessible and inclusive design mean to you. Um, in general, a design process that consider full range of human diversity with respect to ability, language, gender, and other forms of human differences is designing uh, products and services that are accessible to and usable by as many people as reasonably possible. 
with the need of a special adaptation or a specialized design. Again, one of the things is that the more you put time on making your content, your courses um, accessible, uh, the less accommodation needs will be needed um, as it was emphasized by our keynote speaker today. So in your design practices, consider what kind of students you might have and any small steps that you take um, today to make your online program, it will pay off in the future and it gives more a students opportunity to engage with your course materials. One of the ways as we talk about um, inclusive design and accessible design is universal design for learning. And in the next few slides, I'm going to briefly talk about universal design for learning. The universal design learning, uh, the framework was created by researcher at Center for Applied Special Technology at Harvard University. If you want to get to know more about UDL, if you just Google CAST UDL, you get all the information, all their wonderful resources. The, uh, in the overall framework was the result of alignment of three conceptual shifts, um, advancement in architectural design, which was about universal design, development in educational technology, and discoveries from brain research. Universal design for learning is an approach to curriculum design that can help teachers to customize their curriculum to serve all learners, um, regardless of their ability, disability, age, gender, or culture, or ling linguistic ba background. So it provides kind of a blueprint for designing strategy, material assessment, and tools to reach out to your students with diverse needs and help them learn. Um, universal design have uh, three principles, three simple principles. And I think that it was actually mentioned by um, yesterday students panel when they asked what is the best option for you about accessibility. I, I believe one um, mentioned about giving options. So UDL is about um, providing options. The three principles um, uh, uh, here are presented here. The first one is that provide multiple means of representation. Means that um, offer your content, your course, your classroom materials in different format, not only in text, it can be video, it can be images, it can be different way of providing different ways to present the information that you want. The second principles is providing options for engagement use different ways to engage your students, keep them motivated and stay motivated throughout the process. So if one student is excited with group work, another person might be scared even participating. So try to connect with your students, get to know, uh, try to get to know them and understand and get them engaged. The third pr principles is multiple means of action and expression which means giving students different options to demonstrate their knowledge. So um, if you know the goal, if you know the, what outcomes you want your students to learn, the best way is that to give them options to demonstrate that knowledge. Because of the time of today's session, I won't be able to go through all the principles, but I wanna just share with you a few simple tips in order to make sure that some of your online content are more um, accessible uh, using some of these guidelines. The focus of this next few slides would be on the first um, principle, which is providing multiple means of representation. So um, I think that the first thing is that to describing your visual. Um, as you see that one of the questions is that, um, most of the time when I work with faculty members, they think about like the responsibility that is a lot of work to provide alternative text for images. And what makes a good alternative text? Normally my answer, and we have um, a few resources that we can share, but one of the good answer, one of the answer that I always give to instructors is that what is the message that you want from this uh, um, to deliver through this image? 
or what do you want your students by looking at this image to learn? So this example, this particular example to show you the difference between figure description or image description and alternative text. The description can just simply talk about some of the features of the image in this example would be the result of the field test. The second part, which is alternative text, talks about the comparison, what exactly you want students to learn by just looking at the image, that what impacts something to starve, to get dry in a field, and what makes it um, kind of live. So this is one alternative, um, good example of alternative text and how to use it. Or another way to look at um, how to provide a good alternative text is that if you have uh, someone to close their eyes and you have an image, how do you want to describe that image that to deliver the message you want them to learn? That would be your um, alternative text. Another tip is that make sure that you use um, proper font size um, and use proper color contrast. Uh, you have a students who might be colorblind in your classroom. And sometimes I use this example to see that um, how many, like read the numbers in the, each circle. Um, some people say, and when I talk with different faculty or staff, they might say, well, I'm using red or green. Is that accessible? Well, it is accessible as long as you are not using color to convey information. And what I mean by that is that if you say correct answer is in green or correct answer is in red, the person who are colorblind may not be able to see it. Or they might even sometimes the blend or less contrast, they might not even see the, the information that you are using. So color contrast and using, not using color for conveying uh, information is important. So, Another thing is describing your hyperlinks. And um, the reason I emphasize on this is that if you say click here for information or find this information here, if the link is broken, it would be hard for the person to find who is using assistive technology to use it. And again, as I emphasized at the beginning of the session, if you have a if you focus on accessible design, it's a good practice because doesn't matter if someone has a disability, if the link is lost, they can just Google it and find it. Another emphasis I have is heading using headings um, because those who use a screen reader as assistive technology, um, uh, the screen reader works very well by using the headings in order to make things um, accessible. Again, these are some of the very simple way to ensure. And as I say, um, if you take one step to make your content accessible, it means that you are giving um, access to more and more people. And again, to emphasize, considering the importance of accessibility and the number of that students are registered, I wanna just bring to your attention that BC also um, passed a um, policy uh, legislation, uh, accessible BC, British Columbia um, accessibility law. And uh, by September 1st, 2022, um, all 750 public sectors um, organization need to have an accessibility committee, accessibility plan and feedback form to receive. So we are all into it to make it uh, more accessible for our students. With that, I'll pass it on to AJ. At the UBC Center for Accessibility, uh, that's where I work, students can register and um, we work with them to set up accommodations for their studies that might be a fit. So sometimes students might come to us looking for certain accommodations like note taking or extended time for exams, but when we connect with them, there might be other accommodations for their studies that might be a fit, such as like a reduced course load for scholarship um, and different things. And so typically when we're connecting with students, we're kind of working with them um, and figuring out those accommodations, looking at their kind of narrative, the history of accommodations, and also um, kind of the documentation would play into that. So these are just some examples on this slide of what kind of accommodations, um, some of the types of accommodations our office, um, you know, provides for students. And so I'm just gonna move this to the next slide. So I think one of the most important things in terms of figuring out what kind of accommodations or and how to make an accessible learning environment is to really know um, what the needs of the class are. 
And the kind of example I give with this is often, um, you know, there's certain kind of accommodations or certain kind of ways we can adapt the learning environment that doesn't require knowing the nature of a medical condition um, to create a, a really good environment. So for example, I don't necessarily need to know if someone has migraine, headaches, or concussions to know that having kind of like low lighting in the back of the classroom might be helpful for people. And so it's important to kind of create a mechanism to receive, um, you know, just to ask for this specific cohort of students that you're going to be working with, what are some of the ways that the uh, learning environment can be designed so it's going to really work for the needs of individuals and the more we can make learning environments work for the needs of individuals, um, you know, the less students would need to register with our office to seek out accommodations. And so um, like, and, and it's also thinking about that people are going to have learning needs that don't relate to disability. So as we saw, there's childcare commitments um, or just care commitments. People often have kind of uh, financial components in terms of, ex, you know, a job. So that might inform how the learning environment is structured. Maybe it makes more sense to have quizzes at the start of class as there's going to be a group of students who might need to step out early, you know, just as an example. Um, so it's, I think that that's a kind of one component is just kind of creating a mechanism to ask, you know, what are some of the learning needs that you as a cohort of students have, and then figuring out what, what could be possible to implement. Um, and there's certain kind of things, for example, like our office might assess um, consideration for presentations, maybe instead of giving the presentation to the class, that's just done with the professor. But you know, could that be an option available to all students? And that kind of piece is that the most accessible options is, is having options. And so um, in terms of kind of being conscientious, it's recognizing that certain kind of things that provide access for one student might actually you know, inhibit access for another student. So if we think about um, a student who might have a hearing disability, sound amplification might be really helpful for that individual. But for someone who may have autism, it may be too loud. You know? And so it's figuring again about how can we create environments that might work. So maybe at the back of the classroom, we could have the sound system off and you know, maybe at this front could be an FM system or you know, there's, just, there's different ways to kind of think that through. And um, the other piece there, in terms of the different options for learning, this would be, for example, thinking in various modalities. So for example, if um, traditionally, let's say on a, well, if we even think about types of assessments, so does everyone need to take an exam or could people choose to take an exam or write a paper? I think we sometimes think of our own experience that, you know, an exam was somewhat stressful, but we don't kind of think about sometimes other people's experience that they have such a significant amount of anxiety that they might be vomiting before that exam, they might be self-harming. And so again, could there be options where people can demonstrate learning in, in different types of ways? Um, and if it is a situation where everyone has to take that exam, could questions be even asked in different ways? So as an example, like, um, you know, if um, in working with, you know, students with visual disabilities, uh, a question if it, you know, a picture of the eye where there's arrows pointing, it says, you know, what is this component of the eye? That's, you know, that's a pretty inaccessible way for them to answer that question. So is there a way to ask that question such as, you know, the blank does blank, you know, and it's being asked in words rather than requiring vision. And could that be open to all students, answer A or B, you know, in terms of, again, the more options we can provide, often kind of the more accessible things can start to become. Um, and, so those would be, yeah, those would be kind of those components. Um, in terms of, I just wanted to kind of speak to concessions and um, approaches with concessions, because often when things, um, when there is kind of more flexible course policies, often that impacts the need even for concessions to occur. So for example, I've worked with instructors who've said, you know, this is the due date so that I can do marking and provide feedback. And so if you want comprehensive feedback, this is the due date to have it in by. But, you know, we can look at other deadlines. I might not be able to get that marking back as fast or have as much feedback, but we, I, you know, it doesn't necessarily that all, you know, everything has to be submitted by that. So again, it's thinking through creative approaches. And um, one of the kind of most common concessions we see is a midterm often reweighted to a final exam. And just thinking about that for the students registered with our office, like a vast majority relate to mental health and a, about a significant portion relate to anxiety. And so, you know, if a student's really anxious about a midterm, those marks go to the final, you know, how does that um, help to create access? So kind of thinking about when writing a midterm, is it possible to write another version in case there's some students who can't write that date? Maybe it's for reasons of disability, maybe it's for reasons of care commitments, you know, for various kind of things. 
And so is it is that a possibility? And also just thinking about their scheduling. So students who register their office, if our office is providing accommodations, uh, students need to set that assessment up and book it on our website seven days in advance so we can provide those accommodations, set up the staffing levels and, and that kind of component. So making sure that if there is a makeup exam, thinking about have I given students enough time that they would be able to register for this accommodations or have I made them know that because it's less than seven days, I'm providing the accommodations or you know, if some has really unique accommodations, maybe they write off cycle. So just various kind of components to think through. Great. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some other factors that can impact accessible learning. Um, so one aspect uh, that it can impact accessibility is the literal access to the learning materials that you might be sharing with your students. Um, barriers such as the affordability of the learning materials, the technical format of the material. Um, and these days when we're using a lot of online processes and strategies and tools, the bandwidth, and that can be both technical bandwidth, but as well as personal bandwidth needed to connect with the learning materials. Um, and these factors can all impact learning. Um, I do just like to call out specifically how um, cost is an accessibility factor. Um, so the cost of learning materials has a real, a real impact on student wellness, as well as teaching and learning. Um, so for example, the 2020 AMS Ac Academic Experience Survey, which uh, Afsani referenced earlier, uh, found that 28% of undergraduate students at UBC Vancouver indicated that they were somewhat or strongly concerned about not being able to come back to UBC at some point in the future, specifically due to financial reasons. Um, the same survey found that 19% of both graduate and undergraduate students reported having concerns about food insecurity. Um, that's being unsure of the ability to obtain food or feeds oneself on a monthly basis. Um, so if students are buying $800 um, textbooks, uh, they may be having to make real choices um, in terms of their own sort of uh, financial wellness there. Um, and I do just want to put out, uh, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics um, in the U.S., so not sure how this would apply directly to UBC students, but only those people with disabilities, only 19% are gainfully employed. So this may be um, even more impactful for people with disabilities. Um, so financial precarity, uh, precarity can really lead to decisions that may impact learning. Um, so 67% of undergraduate students at UBC Vancouver reported that they went out, they went without a textbook or other course resource um, due to cost at least once, uh, with 28% reporting that they frequently or often go without such learning materials due to cost. And, and that fact always kind of kind of blows my mind. So if 25% of students in our courses are not able to regularly access the materials they need for the course, um, that's sort of an accessibility and a teaching and learning issue. Um, one strategy that, that instructors at UBC are using to address this is the use of OER. Um, OER, or Open Educational Materials, are teaching and learning resources that include uh, full courses, course materials, textbooks, streaming videos, tests, and really any other educational materials that are free of cost and access barrier, and which often carry a legal permission for reuse. Um, generally, this legal permission is granted by the use of an open copyright license, like a Creative Commons license, um, and that allows anybody to freely use, adapt, modify, or edit the resource anytime and anywhere. Um, the 2012 UNESCO Paris OER Declaration uh, that really launched a lot of the OER movement recommended that governments promote and use OER to widen access to education at all levels, and thus in, um, contributing to social inclusion, gender equity, and special needs education. So I like to point out that OER is a great um, strategy for making your course content accessible because it saves time and money. Uh, online versions are free. There's no access code needed. There's no expiration state. So students can retain this on uh, their materials. And it's easy to circulate amongst a unlimited number of students. Um, there's no need to gain permission to pay or use to copy or distribute the OER, and it can be changed and modified without fear of copyright infringement. And because of this, um, it's often available, particularly text-based OER, like open textbooks are often available in a variety of different formats. So if you've ever been to the, the BC Open Textbook Repository, you'll see most textbooks have an online version, uh, um, a uh, 
Windows version, but there's also downloadable offline versions. So you can download it as EPUB, you can download them often as MOBI files, as PDFs, um, or often you can access them as raw text. And this provides the option. So going back to, to general phrase, we've been hearing a lot that the best accessibility options is options. OER, because they have sort of that free copyright license, really can help support that. It can also be really important for bandwidth. So we often think um, that we all have great access to bandwidth, but oftentimes uh, that's not the case. So uh, it can be anything from a student who's sharing a house with multiple people all using the internet at the same time, or it can be a student uh, doing stuff on a bus or in an area without bandwidth. So maybe better for them to be able to download uh, the materials when they're when they're in an area like university campus where they can access and get online, download those materials, and then be able to access them uh, when they have less bandwidth as well. Um, and I will just note that open copyright license also makes the OER um, really easy to be able to modify it to suit your student needs, your teaching method, your curriculum. And, and um, again, it's often available in a variety of formats. So OER use at UBC is a really common practice in 2020-21 academic year. Uh, we estimated that roughly around 19,000 UBC students uh, took part in 60 courses or course sections that were using open or freely available resources in place of paid textbooks. Um, so what else can affect accessibility? Um, so all sorts of things affect um, can affect the accessibility of a resource. And these things are very much context dependent and can vary from student to student. I really like this list, which was compiled by Josie Gray, the advisor of inclusive design and OER collections at BC campus. Um, and for example, a student's day-to-day -day life can, can uh, impact or affect their access. Consider a student has to commute on a crowded bus for hours a day and may have more anxiety this time, this term because there's still COVID out there, or a student has multiple roommates who need to attend streaming sessions at the same time. Um, this may impact their ability to, to access um, their, their learning. Another example is differences in digital literacies um, and technology. So many of us who work on a computer all day often take for granted our comfort and experience with working with digital content. Um, a student can't learn from a resource that they don't know how to use or don't like using. And I think we can't always make an assumption just because students um, are often on devices that they actually know how to, to use the resources that we're putting out there. Um, and some platforms may not work well on mobile devices like tablets or phones. And that may be the only way the students are able to access those if we're using online content. Um, the final thing I, I wanna come back to is uh, something that Afsani mentioned is the, the, the structure of information, how you organize and structure your textbook or resource um, to make it to make it easy to use and easy to find information and navigate is really important. Um, this means paying attention to numbers of chapters, the titles, the use of sections and subsections, numbering systems, headings, and more. Providing well-structured information really makes that uh, information easier to navigate. Um, these considerations will vary from book, book to book and course to course, but the more intentional you are about thinking about the structure, organization, and navigation of your online content um, and your courses and your module, the more useful and powerful um, those materials will be. Um, so day-to-day -day life, digital literacy, access to technology, all these things are very individualized and context dependent. Um, and all these things, um, in my role, I like to point out that OER in particular has the potential to really make a difference. Everyone has a preference for how they'd like to access their learning materials and OER um, that are available in multiple options or multiple formats will make it possible for students to pick the format that they're most comfortable with and that works best for them. Um, I do like to, to say though, it just doesn't end with the use of, of OER or, or using UDL. Um, I do like to, to really encourage the idea of feedback um, throughout the course. So uh, were students aware of all the formats or mod modalities available and how to use those formats? Um, you know, just asking, did they find anything confusing structurally? Like if, if did, were they able to navigate the course? Um, were they able to find information? Did it work on their devices? Um, again, uh, we sort of assume everybody is using the devices that we're using, but that may not be the case. Um, as somebody who works a lot in the UBC Wiki, when I um, learned the students were really using tablets to edit the wiki. It was a different experience because I had never used a tablet myself and had made the assumption that no one would edit the wiki with a tablet. And that forced some, some changes of thinking for myself. Um, these are just a couple of toolkits that I particularly like. Uh, so the main one is the BC Accessibility Toolkit. So um, if you're interested in UDL and, and the idea of designing your content to be accessible, 
that's a great place to start. Um, we did modify it as well for the OER Accessibility Toolkit. Uh, these links are on that wiki page that we shared and, and I can show them out as well. Um, it looks like Charlotte has, has shared them in the chat. Um, and they're good places to get sort of information and hands-on experience um, with doing some of the very specifics for making course content accessible. Um, if you're interested in OER, there is funding available. I won't go into this, uh, but at open um, at oerfund.open.ubc.ca, if you're on the UBC Vancouver um, uh, campus, we do have grants that can support your use and, and creation of OER. On the UBC O campus, there's the Aspire 2040 grants that can use um, that can support the use of OER on that campus. Um, Afsani, do you want to talk briefly about this, the uh, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion course? Uh, sure. Uh, this inclusive teaching course, um, it's an open course. It has five module and introductory level, uh, which is for um, those who are keen in teaching and learning to make their learning and teaching um, environment more inclusive. Um, the five modules um, are focused on one of them is bias, power, and privilege. One introduction to UDL, another one introduction to inclusive teaching practices, another one, fourth one on conversation on decolonization. And uh, the last one is navigating difficult conversations. So if you are instructor interested in any of this concept, you can um, register yourself in Canvas. As I say, it's an open course and access one of them. It's not important to uh, where to start, which module, but I would strongly recommend to start with module one. The reason is that you get to know more about the terminology and um, knowing about our own biases is, is a key thing for us in order to move us forward. So, so just to, to um, briefly summarize, I really believe one of the things that's, that's been a silver lining during the time of COVID um, and particularly the last couple of years, is the idea of empathy. And I really feel like the idea of empathy in teaching and learning has increased. Um, I believe it goes both ways. I think students have a lot more empathy for the work that their instructors do. Um, they had a little bit more um, insight into how instructors um, construct courses and course design and, and the actual practice of teaching. And I also think it goes the other way, that instructors have a lot of empathy for their students. Um, and just continuing to keep this empathy alive and continuing to care for our students and have our students care for us, I think is a really important part of making things accessible. Um, with that, we wanna know what's working for you. Um, how is accessibility, um, how are you approaching accessibility and, and what are the areas that are, are going well? And, uh, we have a bit of time and we're just going to open it up for, for questions and comments at this point. And maybe will we do that? I'm going to go ahead and turn off the screen sharing so we can, can all see, see each other. So uh, if you do have a, questions or comments or if things something you want to share that's working well for you, please just go ahead and put it in the, the chat or turn on, turn on your mic and, and go ahead and say it. Um, we're a fairly small group. So hi, Christina. Hi. Let's just say something that that I found that's working well. So um, there's a, a lot of products where you can run accessibility checkers. Um, so I learned that you can do this in Microsoft Word, you can do it in Microsoft PowerPoint. Um, and uh, it, that's a, a way that's been really helping me to um, remember, you know, what I should do to make my documents more accessible. And one thing that I found, and I'm a sighted person, one thing that I found when I did it with um, Microsoft Word was the headings. You can now suddenly have this little sidebar that makes it really easy, and the same in PDFs, makes it really easy to go through the document because you've got actual headings in your document, not just bold, right? So you get this outline, right, that you wouldn't otherwise get. So I don't know, I guess I would just say use the accessibility checkers because they provide useful suggestions and they're probably already on your machine. <laughs> Same thing with Canvas, you have the Canvas too. 
thank you very much for this presentation. <laughs> and uh, Jeff just added a comment to the, the discussion as well, that the annotation function on Zoom, as we we're talking about tools, works really well um, because it allows people to not feel comfortable to speak and participate. And um, I once worked with an instructor who basically changed his whole um, participation in class model from making comments during the class to also making comments uh, on, in the Canvas chat thing. And he said it just opened up the whole discussion quite a bit more because it turned out there's a lot of students who weren't comfortable speaking in front of their colleagues in a large class. And, and uh, uh, yeah, definitely. And I would say too, like um, something we talked about at the Center for Accessibility and kind of the advising context was even like um, having camera off or on and kind of what we're talking about as well, if we were doing like a phone appointment, often, you know, a camera would, you know, we wouldn't have access to visual information. It can be nice on a Zoom to kind of get an idea of learners in terms of like, are they zoning out and that kind of component, but it's recognizing that does everyone have to have camera on, right? Like some people are in unsafe learning home environments that, you know, that it's not safe for them. Um, you know, that is their own personal space. So just thinking again, does it have to be everyone, everything the same. And we also have just the floor open if folks have questions that they're kind of chewing on. And I'll just note, AJ and Afsani are, have a lot of expertise in, in different approaches to accessibility. So definitely take advantage. Of I have a question. Um, in terms of asking students their need at the beginning of the semester, would you recommend Quadtricks, which is you can stu students can respond anonymously. So we do, they don't have to disclose their identity, but then we can know their need, or do you have other suggestions? Yeah, I think that that could be, you know, one, like, um, one of the things that kind of in thinking about is the kind of the, that we don't, again, necessarily need to ask any kind of medical question per se, like, you know, what's the medical rationale for this implementation of accommodation. So it's just, I think we put out something really general, like, you know, are there ways that um, if there, you know, if there's things in this course are gonna be helpful for your learning needs, please like, let me know, um, you know, and that again, maybe that could be a Qualtrics survey that maybe that approaching during office hours, you know, cause different kind of for formats again, are gonna work better for certain individuals. Some may have high concerns, you know, just letting you know that they would have any kind of need. Others are very open to talk about what their, their needs are. So it's, you know, it can be a, a range. Donna, I see you have your hand up. So. Yeah, hi. Um, I wonder, AJ or um, Afsane or Will, um, a few of us, a few programs, particularly in the Faculty of Medicine, are distributed, right? We have learners sitting remote from us in Prince George, soon to be in Surrey, um, et cetera, et cetera, you know, Okanagan. Um, our way of teaching is so different now here at Point Grey Campus, where we have to stand in front of a camera, we can't roam around the room we can't put a therapeutic touch you know to say good job like so much has changed and even in our use of technology across these multiple screens and um, I just wonder I mean we're, we've been experimenting and exploring and things will unfold for us um, but if if any um, accessibility things have come through that we should be aware of or any <laughs> I, enormous tips or tricks would be super helpful. I'm, 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 I mean, I've been teaching for such a such a long time. This is sort of so out of my comfort zone. It's going to be quite a learning experience. Yeah, I think um, I think what I've kind of noticed is that again, that those kind of differing access needs. So for some people, um, you know, let's say who might be managing chronic pain, getting to campus is very difficult. So having kind of um, the access to attend class like in an online environment can be really helpful. Um, for some students with like ADHD, they've you know said that sometimes they really prefer an in-person class because it's a bit, they feel just a bit more anchored. And sometimes when there's different things going on different websites, just it's again that impact on focus. So um, you know, anytime there's kind of a a new approach or something that kind of new that can present its own access challenges for different groups of people. But I, so I think that the most important component is having a mechanism to receive feedback, you know, for people about like how things are working for them. And again, um, you know, it, we don't necessarily, again, need to know that medical condition to just um, ask that feedback, like, you know, how was this learning experience for you just at the start to front load it? Are there any kind of learning needs that are going to help you in this course? And now that we've gone through this course, you know, how was that for you? You know, and so because every cohort will be different in terms of that. So I think that that's, you know, having that mechanism for so that it's not operating in a kind of a black box, that there is a chance to, for communication to occur. And just adding to what AJ mentioned, one of the things we encourage is that the first uh, few weeks to um, understand the climate of your classroom, your cohort, um, through feedback, through simple question, having one hour, office hours, 
virtual office hours to connect with them, to see their needs. Some organization already started having accessibility statement in their course syllabus, um, where they share their resources um, and um, just to be open to talk about, like encourage them to come forward if they have their, uh, any needs or actually provide some of the resources for them that if you don't feel comfortable, you still feel you need to connect with someone to have uh, to contact center for accessibility or contact wellness. Those are the things that is important, particularly very early in the program or um, at the start of the term, just to set up that climate for students so that they feel welcome, they feel comfortable to share their needs and uh, their accommodation needs. And I think I'm just going to build too is that, um, you know, oftentimes students are taking like multiple classes. So they're being exposed to different instructors doing different things. So um, putting again that mechanism for feedback. So you can say, like, hey, you know, I'd love to hear from folks what's been working really well in terms of, you know, making your courses accessible or how you're interfacing with these kind of online technologies. So we can think about it for this course um, so that that's going to kind of that sharing of ideas can kind of come forward. Um, and the other thing I was just thinking too is sometimes it's also just questioning like our cultural relationship to certain kind of components. And, and why I say that is like when I, um, you know, I've kind of grew up in Vancouver and my understanding when I went to school was like, you know, this is the deadline. And when I went to Barcelona where there's such a flexible understanding of time, like arrival time was in that kind of like half hour zone, you know, um, and a total different relationship where there someone wouldn't be like irritated that someone was late. They're like, oh, okay, I've arrived early and we got a coffee, I'll enjoy life, you know? And so it's that piece of like, sometimes again, like does like, again, so what's our understanding of this kind of concept of a deadline? Does it have to be so rigid? Do we have to have a rigid or flexible relationship to deadlines or time? And could it be, again, that approach where, like, you know, this is the deadline if you want your feedback in a week, but I can still accept it, but this is going to be the impact if you hand it in past that time. So, again, just kind of challenging ourselves. Is there different ways to understand education or concepts? Yeah, it's going to be really interesting in that I will never see the 16 people who sit in Prince George on the campus up there. Right. So again, that relationship, that empathy, which we know the last two and a half years we've had, we've worked so hard to, to build like a, a sense of trust and caring and student first, student safety, student wellness. Um, yeah, it's just, I, I just was wondering about, you know, students who are registered with Center for Accessibility. Now, this is the way we have to teach. This is the technology that's put in place. And this is the way it has to be done, beamed from mothership up north and um you know it's it's might not work for me or 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 the, or, or the 64 sitting in point gray and the in 16 sitting in prince george but i will um i'm sure we will be in touch and um keep um picking people's brains and i'll just note um in terms of like the resources and the learning materials one one of my big tip or suggestion is it's easier to build in the accessibility and the universal design as you're creating them rather than, than necessarily trying to go back. So just keeping it in mind as, as you develop. Um, share my screen again briefly uh, with our email addresses and our contact information. Um, and uh, do, don't hesitate, sorry, do reach out. Um, don't hesitate to reach out if, you, if, we, if there's anything we can follow up on or if you do have other questions. Um, but we still have another minute or two if you, if you wanna ask them as well. So great, well, I'm not seeing a ton. So I just wanna maybe take this time to thank you for coming today and engaging in the, this topic. Um, and uh, really appreciate, um, again, your, your engagement today.